All right. Well, welcome everyone to the final week of the MCIC series. As a reminder, the MCIC series is a virtual conference series offered throughout the month of March. And this Wednesday will be the last day of the conference series. So thank you all again for participating and engaging in whatever way you have been able to this month. Uh, as of this morning, we have uh, 583 people who have registered for the conference. So that's an amazing number. Maybe by Wednesday, we'll be at 600. We'll see. Uh, as a reminder, the series is hosted by the Department of Campus Climate, although we've had a lot of other partnership from folks across the entire institution. Soon, Caden will be sharing our community standards within the Zoom chat. I would like to ask folks right now to please mute your microphone when you aren't speaking throughout this session. This is just um, respectful to our presenters and also reduces background noise. We do expect folks to read these community standards and abide by them today and through the final sessions of this series. Closed captioning is available for all of the sessions during the MCIC series. You should be seeing closed captioning happening now at the bottom of your screen in a dark gray box. If you do not, please follow the steps on the screen. And if you are having any technical difficulties, please message us either publicly or privately utilizing the Zoom chat. As a reminder, most of the sessions during the MCIC series will be recorded, and this session today is being recorded. This is being done to make the sessions as accessible as possible for those who cannot attend live, and our recordings are available up to three business days after the live session occurs. You can find uh, recordings for this month on our Campus Climate YouTube channel and also on our SharePoint site. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns regarding today's session or anything else related to the MCIC series, please message us using the Zoom chat, or we are also monitoring our email, so please reach out to us at campusclimate at uwplat.edu. We also wanted to mention that during this session, if you have questions about the content at any time, you can also utilize the Zoom chat and message Kaden or myself publicly or privately, and we will help share those questions within the session today. Additionally, we are going to be wrapping up this session um, close to the hour, although Mandy has agreed to stay a few moments after if folks want to process or ask uh, any further questions. And finally, I would like to introduce Mandy Wood. Her session today is entitled Mental Health and First Generation College Students. This presentation will focus on the experiences of first-generation college students and how first-generation college students experience mental health concerns. Topics explored will include identification of factors that higher education institutions could pursue in order to improve outcomes for first-generation college students and things that individual staff and faculty can do to improve mental health for first-generation college students. Mandy Wood is co-leading this session today she is an associate counselor for University Counseling Services at the University of Wisconsin Platteville. I will now turn things over to Mandy. Awesome. Um, and I will share my screen. Oh my goodness. <sighs> I know that we have been working on Zoom for a while and still I forget how to do things. Um, the other thing I wanted to do was introduce um, my co-presenter, Michelle Zettelberger. Michelle Zettelberger is a behavioral health therapist at Platteville Family Resource Center. Um, Michelle and I have worked together for the past few years and while we no longer work at the same place, we definitely still have a lot of the same passion in mental health um, and so we're going to be kind of sharing some of the experiences that we found about first generation college students and other things like that. Um, my, our presentation is going to be a little informal. 
Um, so feel free to interrupt and ask questions. We'll have a few, we have a poll and then some whiteboard activities too. Um, so basic objectives are to recognize common concerns of mental health concern, common concerns of mental health concerns of college students, particularly first generation students, and understand the intersectionality that compounds factors for students who identify as first generation. And then what actions or support universities can play in improving mental health outcomes for first generation college students. So, and I wanna start by even saying like, I started looking into research about what are the specific interventions and things that can be done, particularly in the mental health field. And most of the articles said, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know specifically mental health. We know what will help first generation college students. So I tried to overlap the best I can um, in some of those ideas and some of the other things. So first of all, just some basic definitions. A first, college gen first generation college student is any student whose parents have not completed a bachelor's degree. And mental health is the emotional, psychological, social well-being um, that people experience. And everyone has mental health, and it affects the way we think, act, and feel. So I want to just do my first poll. Oh, you got to hit the poll button. So it should be up for you all. I just wanted to say really quick for those maybe viewing through Whova, if you can't use the poll, you can also just throw your answer in the Zoom chat, yes or no as well, if you'd like to, could, to participate. I'll give it another second or two. Okay, wow, we are e very evenly split. So 52% of us here are first generation college students. Um, wow, that's a, that is not the split I was expecting actually. Um, so Michelle and I are both first generation college students. So that is why we have some passion at going to this um, presentation. So I'm gonna just give brief mental health background. Some of you may already know this information. Um, definitely the difference between mental health and mental illness. Mental health is something we all have, but mental illness might be something or symptoms that we experience that are dysfunctional to our day-to-day -day life and our living. 39% um, of college students experience significant mental health concerns. So those would be things like major depression, bipolar disorder, um, significant anxiety concerns or schizophrenia. Um, this statistic changed from everything I've learned. It's one in five adults in the U.S. have a diagnosable mental health or mental illness or mental health condition. Um, and 50% of the population will experience mental health conditions in their lifetime. So to get a little more specific to uw Platteville, in knowing kind of like what our numbers are and things like that, Top mental health concerns for UW Platteville students include anxiety, stress, depression, and low self confidence. Um, and in fall 2020, our 10 day enrollment numbers of Platteville campus show a total of 6,378 students totally enrolled in UW Platteville, with 5,479 were um, Platteville campus undergraduate students. 8% of these students were students of color and 1% were international students and 38% were first generation college students. So we definitely have quite a significant um, population of first generation college students here on campus. Um, so we know there are any student who, who, whose parents do not have a four year degree other things about first generation college students are they are more likely to be older. They're more likely to come from a racially diverse background. 
um, to have a disability, to be a non-native English speaker, to come home from households earning less than $25,000 a year annually and experience camp any campus climate as unwelcoming. With that being said, the mental health kind of symptoms that they might experience, um, they're more likely to, first generation college students are more likely to experience depression um, and anxiety, but they are less likely to identify a need for services. They're, or they're more likely to need the counseling services, but less likely to utilize it than other students. And some of the reasons that came up were the location of where services might be, be being provided, the time in their schedule, being unaware, um, cost of services, while that's not a problem here at UW Platteville, many other campuses do charge for their mental health or their health services. And then the hours were inconvenient. Um, and going back to that intersectionality piece of first generation college students might come from racially diverse backgrounds, their staff on the counseling services may not have a person of diverse background. And so that limits their involvement in um, utilizing those services on campus. Um, other things that kind of came up about first generation college students, um, there's a strong belief that they need to be self-reliant, not burden others, including staff and faculty have increased demands for their time from work or from family or work, believe that things won't get better for them, perceive high levels of judgment in using support services on campus. So I know Michelle had a lot of personal stories about how, how this comes up, um, seeing, providing therapy. And then I even know, like I mentioned to my own therapist that I was doing a presentation on this and she told me that her parents didn't know that they were supposed to come to her to drop her off at college. And so she was all alone that first day. So I'm gonna hand it over to Michelle to share some personal stories. Well, and one of the things I, I just thought of as Mandy was running through some of that stuff was when we're talking intersectionality, I think that I often forget. Um, and I wanna remind people that diverse background also includes some of our kids who not only come from the big city and have um, racial differences, but also our rural kids. I've worked with a lot of families that that are farm kids and the big thing from farm kids and from some of those families and the first gen kids is you keep it in the house and we fix it here and you don't go talk to anybody. So that may be why they're not seeking out anything from the services that are available on campus. Um, that was something that was just kind of a light bulb and I made myself some notes to remind me to talk about that a little bit. Um, so to think about those kinds of things when we're thinking about that. One of the things I was, I talked about with Mandy is um, I'm a first gen. Um, my parents, to take me to college, I, it was a big eye opener. Um, I'm the youngest of three. And so when we went off to school for mom and dad to be like, oh my gosh, all of this stuff. They had no idea what it all involved from my FAFSA to um, filling out for housing and all that kind of stuff. So when our, we have twins that are graduating in May um, and they're doing all of that now. So even when we are sitting down and talking with them and trying to help them understand that you're taking on this loan and yes, you have to sign and it's yours they put a lot of pressure on themselves that they're like, oh my gosh, there's a scraping loan. And, and if they already have anxiety, um, that gets exacerbated. So when you go forward to some of my students that I have, that I see in my office, they already are anxious. So coming in as freshmen, they're already anxious. They may not have had the counseling services in their junior, senior year in high school, and now they need to figure out how am I going to deal with my anxiety? I'm coming to college. My parents are inspecting all these things of me and I'm expecting all the stuff of me and their anxiety gets in the way and their grades drop. So they need to find a way not only to manage their mental health stuff, but 
manage their grades and how am I gonna get all my homework in on time? And how am I gonna manage, you know, trying to figure out homework plus I wanna hang out with my friends. And so we have all these other things that they have to try and figure out. You know, you, you go from home where you have this, this nice little shell to protect you in a lot of our homes, not all of them. And then you go to college where you're on your own. That's, I could go on and on, but I, I know we have just a little bit of time. Definitely, those things are come up for students. Um, so then I also wanted to talk about some of the mental health trends that we're seeing in 2020 and 2021. Um, usually there's a little dip in people's mood every year. Um, and we, because of the lack of sunlight and living in the Northern hemisphere. Um, so we see a, a little dip in mental health and wellness in October every year. And then we start to see improvement in the spring. Um, in August, 2020, the CDC surveyed um, people between the ages of 18 to 24, and 25% of that population had seriously considered suicide in the past 30 days. Um, Mental Health America indicated that 19% of adults, um, and this was, was this was the 18 to 24 um, kind of range, had a were experiencing a, a mental illness currently. Um, and that was 1.5 million more people than in 2017. And then over 2020, 2020 and 2021, 27.3% of youth and 26.3% of adults received depression treatment consistently. So that means of those that experienced depression in 2021, approximately like 70 to 75% did not get consistent and needed treatment. And then there's a lot of being research being put out that mental health professionals are experiencing burnout at the same rate as first responders. So we think those law enforcement, um, just because of the increased need and demand on their ability to serve patients. Um, so how does all of this affect first generation college students? And I think Michelle Sonnen summed it up so well. First generation college students are students who have the multiple stressors and have limited support and are at greater risk for stress and potential negative health and mental health concerns um, because they have, they're some of the most vulnerable on campus due to that intersectionality and maybe missing the scripts to help them be successful. So then we move into a little bit of things that can help. So some of the things we already have here at UW Platteville, we're trying to make a difference. So the TRIO programs, the summer bridge programs, our first year experience. I also wanted to highlight Peers Promoting Mental Health. Um, this is kind of a newer group run by um, the, the peers group out of the Dean of Students Office. Um, but they specifically have a peer group on Thursday nights where they are spending a lot of time helping students um, support mental health. And then some of the things that we can all work on as a campus too, are having a dedicated campus culture of valuing dis diversity and stigma reduction. Um, so if we have a top-down approach to support of diversity and stigma reduction and support at every culture, or at every turn, can make a huge difference. That was one of the huge pieces of research that came out of this was every article said this. Um, the next one was really like partnerships between mental health services on and off campus and other departments. So really integrating mental health into those things. Um, and that doesn't necessarily have to be like assuming every, every single student you come in contact with has depression or a diagnosable concern. But we know from this year, every student we come in contact with has some stress in their life or has some significant stress in their life. And then also another really, really big thing that came out of the research were like these mental health mentorship and ongoing peer programs. Um, so they would be like, and granted it may not be possible at UW Platteville, but they would have like 
a training program for um, a psychology degree or a social worker counseling and they would have um, individuals who were in the internship program take on a freshman who might be first generation and has identified having a mental health concern and just helping them navigate some of the campus practices along with like regularly using self-care um, and programs like that. And I also, I'm gonna share this. I did steal it from one of my coworkers in a presentation we gave earlier this month because this coworker is so awesome um, and just shares great information. And so one of the things that is really important too um, is having like a pedagogy of kindness, expressing empathy for students and believing what they say is true um, rather than feeling like, oh, they might not be telling me the whole truth. Um, and particularly in the environment that we've been living in, it's really hard to have connection. And we know that connection definitely is gonna improve some of those mental health concerns, along with helping students that may struggle to connect, um, giving them some time to connect with others virtually. Um, so like just having time to chat in classes or in meetings that you know students are present. Um, and letting them make some choice in what is helpful for them. So it may not be super helpful for them to have an advising meeting today because they have so much other stuff on their plate. And while your schedule might be really full, it might be helpful to give them that time to chat with you and plan another time for that advising meeting. Um, and I'm gonna have Michelle talk to, about self-care. Um, but I think that's the other piece of this that I want to start with is like, you cannot fill and help students with an empty cup. So it's important that we talk about self-care. Oh, I am not great at technology. So I'm going to let Michelle take over. So when I talk about self-care, I think it's super important to remember that we have to take care of ourselves because in thinking about if I'm not okay, if I'm not okay, as myself, I am not a good mom, I'm not a good friend, I'm not a good therapist, I'm not a good wife, right? Like I'm not, I'm not good to anybody. So we have to remember to take good care of ourselves. And in that we have to remind our students, our clients, just to take care of themselves. And I know that right now self-care is the, I don't know what word I'm looking for. It's the, it's the buzzword, but you know, self-care can be anything from taking five minutes in the morning to not jump on your phone right away. Um, this device, which sits on my desk, okay? Mandy knows me, it's got pink flamingos on the back and Jason may even know that too. It's got pink flamingos on the back. Um, we are such a community of having to have that phone attached. It's like it's attached to our bodies. It doesn't have to be. So if you put that thing away, if you wake up in the morning, and in my house, we have two cats and a dog. And every morning, one of my cats crawls up on my chest and I spend two or three minutes just petting her and being mindful about what that feels like, okay? And some of this may sound kind of, one of my friends calls it kind of woo woo. But if, if you spend time with dealing with the five senses and I preach this to my clients, not just my students that I work with and my own children. And I will tell you, my children get tired of hearing it. Um, you spend time working on the five senses and feeling and really grounding yourself, you're going to feel better. Self-care can be anything from taking five minutes and going outside and going for a walk, taking five minutes and going outside and just standing and looking. Um, earlier, before everybody got let in the room, there was conversations about watching dogs outside or watching the snow plows, or someone was talking about watching birds running in their yard. The way my office is set up, I look out the window and last week, there was a difference between Monday and Wednesday and the trees had budded. Like, while that's kind of distracting for me, when I'm not doing paperwork, I can see the birds, I can be mindful, I can watch the trees move. It says bird watching, says somebody in the, in the chat box. Super important because you're mindful, right? Super important to take care of yourself in healthy ways had a conversation last week with somebody and our students forget this, drink your water, okay? Before this, 
I had a conversation with a client of mine. This sits on my desk in my Dodgeville office. I have one that sits on my desk in my Platteville office. I carry one in my vehicle. Drink your water. Guys, if you don't drink water, your brains, thank you, Emily. If you don't drink water, your brain's not going to work. Okay? Your body's not going to work you don't function, our bodies are made of water, okay? If you're tired, the other thing I talk with my clients about, if you're tired, sleep, like take a nap, lay on the couch, close your eyes, focus on your breathing, sit in your chair, and how many times when I don't have patience, I will just sit in my chair and close my eyes and breathe for a little bit. Um, Listen to podcasts. There's all kinds of podcasts, things out there that support podcasts. Spotify, um, I have one downloaded. I have a bunch of podcasts I listen to. Find some that you like. I've encouraged some of my clients, like I will talk with them and be like, hey, listen to this one. Um, Mandy knows I'm a huge, huge, huge Rachel Hollis fan, huge Dave Hollis fan. Um, there's other people I listen to now that I think are amazing. Um, Instagram, TikTok, but the only thing I caution people on about that is there are time. You can like get sucked into the big vortex. Big thing that I say regarding self-care is try and get yourself off of electronics, right? So when you go to bed at night, and I talk with some of my high schoolers about this. Shut your phone off half an hour before you go to bed. Even my own kids, get off your phone. It's gonna help you sleep better. There's research that says it shuts down your brain, right? Shut your phone off. Don't look at a screen. Shut your TV off. Read a book. Maybe do some wind down yoga for a walk at night, something, right? And I think it's really super important now during COVID, during this time where we're all stuck doing this, right? Where we're stuck on screens, reach out to people, not just through texting. Call somebody, hear a voice. And if you can go for a walk with a friend and do it safely, Man, go for a walk, do it. So the other piece of this to talk about too is community care. And when we talk about community care, it's that kind of idea of checking in on each other's and just making sure that those in your community are doing okay too. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know there was a kind of a statement or comma in the Whova app asking about like making sure to, check, I want to make sure I have it right, but that, that support for everyone in our community that um, know what's going on with people. And that's kind of the idea of community care is what's going on with those in your network. Are they doing okay? And offering support with them with the energy that you have. If you don't have the energy to support them, not offering what you don't have. Um, and then I also wanted to talk about Silver Cloud. So um, I always feel remiss in any presentation I give from counseling if I don't talk about Silver Cloud. Silver Cloud is an online platform that was purchased for all of the UW system campuses um, to help reduce some symptoms of anxiety, depression, and manage stress. Um, so it is both a web-based or a phone app-based. Um, there are the major programs on the first page are gonna be depression, stress management, um, improving insomnia. Um, through March, our office did a program specifically related to reducing um, anxiety and stress from COVID. But it's a really cool app. It has a lot of things. It's got some journaling. Um, it'll have some meditation and other things like that. Oh my goodness, told you. Technology is not my thing always. Um, but generally to sign up, you would go to our SharePoint page and I can put this in the chat in a minute um, and sign up that way. And then you can download it on um, an iPhone or Android. 
So at this point, we do have some whiteboard questions. I'm gonna stop share, get things. So our first kind of question for anybody in the whiteboard is, what have you noticed with the first generation college students you work with? And Mandy, I just wanted to mention, so for those who are viewing this through Whova, again, if you want to respond but aren't able to use the whiteboard, just uh, you could utilize the chat either publicly or privately. We can share your answer anonymously to if you would not like your name attached with it. So, and as a reminder to use the whiteboard, you're going to click view options at the top of your screen and choose annotate. And that should give you a little bar um, and options for uh, writing. So, sorry, thank you. Definitely. Mandy, under your view options at the top of the screen, <clears throat> excuse me, you can click hide annotators um, and that'll oh, keep the board. I did that. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Just in case you, you want it to be anonymous. Yes. Um, I was going to share something that came out of my EWT study this semester that made me so sad, or last fall that made me so sad, was so many of my students told me that in high school they were told that they needed to be so totally self-reliant and dependent and that staff and faculty would not be there to support them or help them and that it was all of their job to figure this out on their own. And that was heartbreaking to me as someone who wants to be there to help support them. That's literally my job in UWP study is to help them navigate the start of freshman year. One of the things I wanted to add that I that I learned from some of the first geners that I work with is that they don't realize that they can change their major. They think that they're stuck with it. Um, and so I've had conversations with them about kind of my journey and how I started in nursing and then I ended up in the counseling program. And that seemed to open some of their eyes to the fact that, you know, you can go in and with one thing and change. Wow. I think these are Hey Mandy, can you verbalize some of the answers? Yeah, so definitely. Um Thanks. so so a lot of what we have are some difficulty navigating the systems on campus, um, just counseling, financial aid, services for students with disabilities, um, experiencing the stigma or related to like help seeking behaviors, don't always know what services are available. Um, many are more onto advice than suggestions. They feel really isolated, like they don't fit in. and. I think 
I think that was really interesting to see like almost 40% of the students this fall were first generation, are unfamiliar with what they need to, to get to the career they want. They don't always have parental support or parents don't know have the knowledge to give good support. They don't know how to make the first connections if they have concerns. They crave value or validation, value mentorship and connection and feel really isolated. Um, not knowing that you can fail out of college if you don't do well ac academically. Proud to be at college. May feel some guilt about family achievement. Some eager to learn, being open to advice. Um, often juggling multiple responsibilities, such as supporting their family back home while having to navigate college on their own. Um, familial pressure to do well because they're the first to go to college. And they are some of the most motivated, inspiring, funniest, and talented, which I thought, that's awesome. Okay. And I know we're doing pretty well on time. So I am going to put the next one up. What have you done specifically to support first generation college students? And what specifically have you done to help support their mental health? So meeting with them as often as needed, refer to CS and other supports on campus, um, trying to validate that they belong here, sharing your own first generation journey, relating to them since I was first gen, spend extra time with them on appointments and remind them of resources on campus and help make first connections. Reach out more frequently, normalize their feelings that they're experiencing. Encourage them to join TRIO or student support services, or TRIO student support services. Mandy, can I hop on the microphone to say mine? It might become a little lengthy. Yeah, go for it. I'll make it quick. I have a, a dear friend named Sakara Wages who helped me process and discern the differences between um, feeling guilty about going off of college and being the first in the family versus um, helping them to understand the tension around um, understanding that um, some of their family members back at home don't have the same social access, right? And so like, I think discerning the difference is, is major because it, it helps to alleviate the distance that I think um, some students feel and create in their minds as they go off to college. So just understanding that there are environmental, um, historical, social, cultural um, systems and structures in place, right, that create some of that tension that they build up. And I think it's important to talk to students about that, right, that, that, that this idea that there's this survivor remorse, I, I don't believe in that. I think our students are savvy and they understand that there's tension. They observe how their family members live at home and they come off of college and they know that shit is wrong and it, it's not right and it doesn't look good and it doesn't feel good. So empowering them with that sort of language, I think has gone a long way. <clears throat> Definitely, Jeremy, I really appreciate that. That was really awesome to hear. Um. I miss them. Um, talk up, talk about my mental health openly, particularly when discussing how my first generation journey impacted me. Um, speak up and out whenever possible when they belong here. Their feelings are valid and they can succeed regardless of what they're going through by taking the necessary steps to do so. 
Um, and I think this is something like we all as first generation students may continue to process and deal with. Um, for example, I will give the my story that I was a first generation college student. I did not do as well in college as I did in high school. Um, I was recently diagnosed with ADHD and process it like integrating that into why didn't I do as well in college? Why, why didn't I reach out as much? And I know a lot of it was I didn't have the focus or attention span because it was so much more academically challenging than high school. And I'm not a first generation college, like I'm an adult that's working now. So even learning and being able to self-validate, I think is such a good thing to teach our students that it is challenging. I think the other thing to remember too, when you're thinking about first gen stories is, you know, when I, when I think about my first gen story, when I was a freshman, um, as I had shared, I came in as a nursing student, but not only did I lose my grandfather, I lost my uncle in the same year. So as I can laugh now at the age of 55 with my parents, I was in the one five club that year, 1.5 grade point average and on, on, you know, academic probation. Um, but a lot of that was because I had all this mental health stuff going on where I lost two people who were pretty important to me. So we have to remind students that, you know, you got to, man, you got to take care of yourself. And sometimes life happens and things that are way out of our control happen. And so it's not just COVID. There could be major things that happen in your life that people are, people could pass. And then you have to figure out how you're going to manage all of that plus school. And so, having all of these extra programs to go to, students need to know where to go and they need to have people to reach out to and then places in the community to go and professors and counselors and everybody who's gonna be understanding that sometimes life's really hard outside of trying to get your assignments in. Definitely. And then one last one on the board, talking with students about how about potential difficulty around them growing and learning new language tools and skills while their family may not have access to those things and may not grow with them. I think that one's really important too. Um, so I have one last one because I wanna make sure we have time for questions if there are any. What support have students sought from you specifically in this virtual learning environment? Because I think that's really unique and challenging to what we're experiencing this year. Um, Mandy, can I just add what Deirdre said? Yeah. Um, kind of on the coattails of what I was talking about and life isn't only hard when in a pandemic and hope we all can remember that come fall. I think that's very true. Thanks, Deirdre. So you support emotionally, but also trying to figure out how to manage the academic stress. Just an opportunity to process and troubleshoot this different learning environment and an increase in students requesting accommodations to mental health. They want to have a check-in more often than usual, sometimes weekly. They're asking for resources such as our counseling services, just the mental health challenges. Um, honestly, very little. It is hard to get students to communicate their needs, even though I can see they're struggling. Definitely very true. Um, a sounding board, listen without responding. Students struggling with being able to balance everything going on in their lives. Students have used me as an outlet to speak on how difficult this whole time during COVID has been. I am not a direct advisor, but they know they can come to me with emotional support as well as real conversations. Money with no strings. 
a culture of care. In, re in regards, to, I'm sorry, Mandy, in regards to the, the comment about very, very little, it's hard to get students to communicate. I think even just letting students know that you're there, just by pointing out and being like, hey, I'm wondering if you're okay. It appears to me as though, and they may not tell you anything, but sometimes just knowing that somebody notices that you're not doing so good would open up the door for them to stick their foot in later and come talk to you about something that doesn't seem like it's mental health related, but may be the opening for them to come back later and say, hey, I really am having a hard time. And I think a really important one that went up here was ways to get connected with other students. Managing suicidal ideation. Definitely, we know I mean, that was in August that that um, study was done by CDC that it was 25% had considered suicide um, in the last 30 days. And I haven't seen a new, a new study about what that is. These are awesome. I really appreciate you sharing these all. I am going to go back to the PowerPoint because I think we are done and ready for questions. Um, so feel free to put questions in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, but Michelle and I are available for questions. I know Michelle has to go before I do. But if you have any further thoughts or considerations, if you have any ideas on specific things that would be helpful, I am definitely open to hearing those things or actions that you might be taking. I put my email um, up here for, for anything you'd like to reach out about. I uh, just wanted to add a quick thought. I think something, I don't directly like advise students or work directly with them usually, but I think something I've seen from a lot of my colleagues, especially folks in the OMSA office is just being really, um, I think down to earth and genuine with students. So when asking like, how are you doing with this pandemic? You know, when students are, are looking for support, just being met with honesty, like, yeah, we're all really struggling. Um, obviously students have different pressures, of course, different, responsibilities and things. But I think that's something that I've been seeing more and more often from my colleagues that I think has been really cool. It's just that vulnerability. And of course, not just like info dumping, like, let me tell you about all my problems, but just like this, you know, like, I think general authentic camaraderie of like, yeah, we are all having a really hard time. What is that looking like for you? I, I just think that's been kind of a cool dynamic I've been seeing more and more. I will say that has been actually a really nice part too, is even though I work directly with students, it's been good to connect with other staff and faculty in that way of like, that idea of community care. How are we gonna support each other in getting through this so that we can continue to support students? Um, if no one else has questions or comments or concerns, like I said, you can definitely email me, but otherwise my, our part of the presentation is done. Um, and then as I say that a comment comes in. Um, oh, this is awesome. Um, Tasha says, one thing I've noticed is that students are sometimes reluctant to use resources because they think that others need it more. Um, 
So I hear this a lot from students too. And one of the things that I've been normalizing and validating is that if you don't use the resources on campus, we're likely going to lose them because they're not seen as needed. So use it as much as you can. In addition, you've already paid for it. Like your seg fees have already paid for almost everything on this campus. And these things are expensive as an adult. So please use them now when they're free to you, even if you don't think you needed them as bad as someone else. Well, I think the thing I would add, you know, and I've heard from clients in my practice, a similar thing um, as to why they didn't come into services sooner is don't compare yourself to somebody else. Your, the issues that bring you into therapy are yours and they're real and they're genuine. Um, and you, you get to be, you belong here. You get to be here. You know, you, you need this just as much as anybody else and you're safe and you're welcome. And, and so please, you know, use this. Well, I do want to thank folks for being here today and thank you to Mandy and Michelle for presenting. Um, we will stick around at, um, till the hour if folks would like to ask questions and maybe a little bit of a smaller setting. Uh, thank you for continuing to engage with the MCIC series and I hope you have a great rest of your Monday.